Okay, so, thank you. So our project uh, was called OMEF, or Optical and Microwave Extension for Flood Mapping. But today I'm just going to primarily talk to you about the, the microwave component of the, the project, because when we submitted our bid for phase one, we, we fully elaborated on phase two as well, which was very much an extension of what we were going to do in phase one to other sensors, and that would be bringing in more optical data, LiDAR data, and other data sets, which I'll discuss further. So we very much focused on the statement of requirements that was put out by the Environment Agency that, that went with the um, call for proposals. And this was very much about improving flood delineation in urban areas, improving flood mapping over large geographical areas and automation so that staff with maybe not as much knowledge could produce flood maps um, during flood events. And so we focused on a proof of concept project and trying to improve the satellite remote sensing algorithms so they could produce better results in urban areas. Um, so to do this, we looked at the current literature on the subject, and we took a, a series of papers, um, the, the Matt Jen and Giustini group in Belgium, and also a paper by Griefenader, and decided they were the, the cutting edge of the, the science, and that was what we were going to implement. Um, and then in our discussions with the Environment Agency, we, we set the areas that we were going to do the flood mapping for. So this started off as being the lower seven in 2007, and that's really because two of those papers focus on those data sets. And we wanted to check we'd implemented the algorithms correctly by running our algorithm on the same data as the original papers. We then picked the Upper Thames in 2014 because that, that data was, so it was clearly available at the time the project started. And then once the project started, we found other floods occurring. So we thought, well, let's try some real data that's coming out of Sentinel-1. And so we also mapped, here I've given York and Spain, but we also mapped Croatia and Scotland as well so that we could test lots of different data sets to check that the scientific algorithms didn't only just run on the example data sets uh, in the papers. And then we evaluated our results by comparing it to the Environment Agency's derived flood layer and the Copernicus Emergency Management uh, Service results. And as well as developing the actual algorithms to do the flood mapping, we also wanted to develop this methodology by which a non-experienced user could run the algorithm and produce a result. And so we developed an Envy software package for that. So it's an extension that, that loads into Envy and can be run by anyone. So this is some of the examples that, that I've got. And so this is TerraSAR-X data for the Upper Thames flooding in 2014. We also have data from Cosmo SkyMed and RadarSat as well. So we compared how well the different sensors could perform, the, the different frequencies used, the different processing techniques we could use in terms of pre-processing, and how our different algorithms worked. And the way, the way the software runs is it tries all four approaches we have implemented at the minute. So there's the very basic first approach, which is what we're calling MatGen, which does the looking for dark areas of water and separating those. Then the Geosterini approach brought in change detection, so you have a non-flood image you compare to your flood image. And then with the Griefenader, we have local contrast enhancement. So that became particularly important with the Sentinel-1 data because you have a very large area you're covering and very small floods in it. So if you do contrasting on the whole image, you don't, you don't pick it up well. In terms of comparison here, what I've done is I've overlaid um, on this particular example the Environment Agency derived layer and our derived layer on top of each other. 
And so we've got in pale blue, um, let's go get it the right way around. <laughs> da, 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 da. The environment agency layer is in red, sorry, and our layer is in blue. So in this particular GIS view, you've got the environment agency layer on top. And on this example, I've got our layer on top. And that was the best way I could think of trying to see where one or the other picked up flooded areas. Because in most of the cases, we, we pick up the same areas. And you can see we don't equally, we pick up a little bit of these permanent water bodies, but, but not much because we have this change detection approach running. But there, it's probably more difficult to see, but there are other areas where we've picked up, as you can see out here, areas that maybe the environment agency didn't, and maybe the environment agency picked up areas that we didn't. And so that, that's an area that does need some further investigation, and it could mean one's right or the other's right, or we're both a combination of right. And that's, for me, where we'll start bringing in this other data, because your SAR data can only give you part of the answer. It will only have seen the flood at the time it went over. And if you've got something like a tree, it'll see the tree and not the flood water underneath. So this is where we could start bringing in a digital elevation model and looking for low-lying land that maybe should have flooded and start to build up an intelligent GIS layer that has the uh, data that was directly detected by the SAR plus an interpolated flood layer that, that builds on top of that. In terms of the Sentinel-1 data, I'm showing you the York example. So... In this case, I've got the Copernicus layer in red and our OMEF layer in blue. So there are some differences here. So we've run our OMEF uh, approach on Sentinel-1 data, whereas the Copernicus Emergency Management Service have been using RadarSat-2 data. So in theory, they've got higher resolution data, which should give them a better result. I would say it's not completely clear to me that that has happened from that higher resolution data from what I can see here. You can see we, we're not quite as extended um, as their layer, and, and that's something that needs further investigation. They also do seem to pick up quite a lot of other areas, and maybe this is partly for what Geraint was explaining, that they're, they're not doing change detection and that, that might be causing that. But equally, we pick up some dark areas as well. And so this is where, again, we, we need to do some, some further work, trying to understand where the differences in the, the two um, approaches are, are getting different results. I think my, my overall feeling is, at the end, what you give the, the end user, if they're, they're fairly intelligent, is not just, this is the flood map, you give them a probability of flooding, where you bring in these different data sources so that they can then make a decision about what it is they, they want to see. Do they want to see all possibly flooded areas? Would they like to see only the areas that have definitely flooded? Or would they like some, some other uh, combination of that? So we found it very, very helpful to work with the environment agency in shaping the project. In the initial stages, we were going to go and have a fully functioning commercial MV module by the end of phase one. But they actually said to us they would prefer we concentrated on the algorithms and proving they worked on all different missions and all locations rather than get a nice front end but have an algorithm that might be still a bit ropey. So we put more effort into the algorithm side than, than we'd originally thought back. And, and we overall got positive feedback, but we, we acknowledge that SAR cannot be the answer that's used alone. But it's a very useful tool for assessing large areas rapidly and then optimizing your, your use of ground or airborne mapping to, to follow on after. So for us, the, the key benefits of our approach would be uh, faster initial flood maps in that this is fully automated process. Um, in phase two, we may de-automate it a bit, actually, so that if you have a user who is intelligent, they can do a little bit of tweaking, but at the minute, it runs fully automated. Um, 
by having a quick response. Um, if you run this on the quickest choice of algorithm, it will come out in about 30 minutes. If you want more uh, complex algorithm, it might take you an hour and a half. So you then make a choice in terms of your speed of decision making as to which algorithm you want to apply or combination of algorithms. Our thought was to use Sentinel-1 as the primary data source. And the aim is to have a web-based interface so that as Sentinel-1 data is available, we download it, we process it, and it's put in the database. So we have a background layer of non-flooding that is growing over time and becoming more accurate. And then as floods occur, you, you can immediately map that as the Sentinel-1 data is ingested. But equally, if the customer wanted to buy Cosmos KMAD or TerraSRX or Radisat, that could equally be ingested into the system. And then if you have more knowledgeable users, they might alternatively want to buy the MV extension and run the, it themselves and do their own flood mapping. So this could be used as both a fast flood mapping solution, but also by processing historical data, we'll, we'll get to understand more about historical flood events as well. So we have these two business models. The one which is the license solution, which is the MV module, which would be an initial license fee and a maintenance fee, and then people will get a continually updated module. And so at the minute, it would just have SAR in it. But as we grow the, the module by adding optical, LIDAR, and other data sets in there, they would have all those capabilities as well. The other option is the, the web-based solution, oh, sorry, where you have a monthly subscription or cost per image. And that is where we'd be doing all the processing in the background and, and you'd put in your request. So you'd either say, notify me if a flood occurs anywhere in my area of interest, or someone would come and say, I want some, some flood mapping of this particular area because there, there's uh, been a flood here. We, we see in terms of this this system, or the first system, we're thinking of a few, maybe a couple of thousand pounds for the MV module in terms of what pricing of MV modules are. It's going to take some money to set up this system for us. So this is what we would use the phase two funding primarily for. But then we, we reckon we could charge one or two thousand pounds, maybe even less, maybe a few hundred pounds a flood map for the output of this solution if someone has got a subscription. Because if we're processing it anyway, the more users we have, the cheaper it becomes to produce. It's not like it has, needs to have a person in there. It will be the underlying cloud computing doing the hard work. So what we've learned, uh, we've learned that scientific research doesn't reside only in a scientific paper. Oh, thank you. Uh, if you read scientific papers anywhere and try to implement them, anyone will know you don't get the, the full answer. You have to read behind it. And I was very lucky. I went to Living Planet uh, recently and met Laura Gisterini, one of the authors. So I could have a, an in-person discussion and find out we were thinking along similar lines, which was good to know, actually. Um, also, because of that, we're publishing what we've done as a scientific paper because we're, we're not worried about that. Even if we publish our algorithm, people can try and implement it from the paper, but they won't have exactly what we have, because you never put everything you know in a paper. It's just impossible to get it in there. So the key gains for Pixelytics is uh, very much the development of flood mapping products for, for end users. But also we see, as other speakers have said, secondary stakeholders in terms of the insurance agency very much strengthened our, our radar processing knowledge, especially having a five-month project where you had really strong deliverables to meet at the end of it, really concentrates the mind, I would say. Uh, positive publicity has been very good, having it up on the SSGP website and other activity. I, I notice even Twitter today, there's been followings going on. Um, and so our aim in terms of the, the commercial product is very much this Sentinel-1 non-flood archive that is then built upon 
and has an automated system alongside this MV module that people can buy. And I'm running out of time. So I think I've said most of this. It gets a bit repetitive, these slides, unfortunately. Um, so it's been very beneficial, uh, um, it, especially in turnover for our company, I have to say. <laughs> our turnover is increased by about 100%, and a large part of that was related to SSGP. So I can say thank you very much for that. Um, and we've used uh, it very much to develop our SAR knowledge, and been, we've been using commercial data and Sentinel-1 data. We've got a nice archive of commercial data now as well, which we can only use on flood mapping projects, but hey, right, we've still got it. Um, and the results have been very encouraging, and we, we've got these clear business models. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, any questions for Sam uh, in terms of her Pixelytics project? Great. Thank you very much, Sam.